Welcome to America's Heroes Group. And welcome to America's Heroes Group with our partner, Jesse Brown, VA Works. May is Mental Health Awareness and Military Caregiver Month, and today is Saturday, May 14th, 2022. Just heard our host, Cliff Kelly. I'm the co-host, Sean Claiborne, Army National Guard veteran. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith, and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And we have a great show for, for you today. We're going to talk about some serious topics. We have a panelist here with us. Dr. John Corpix. He's a psychiatric, a psychiatric and director of mental health at services at J the Jesse Brown VA. And we're going to talk about expanded mental health care at the Jesse Brown VA. So are you there with us, doctor? I am. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me again. So I was going to give the, the audience a little bit of background about your about what you do. So you're the director of mental health services at the Jesse Brown VA with more than 15 years of experience working with veterans. You're also a Chicago native, a psychiatrist. And the fa a faculty appoint have faculty appointments at the University of Illinois at Chicago and Northwestern University, and distinguished fellow of American Psychiatric Association and former counselor for the Illinois Psychiatric Society. And you're going to talk about this uh, uh, dr uh, opioid, if I understand this, uh, buprenorphine. Is that how I say that right? Buprenorphine. Buprenorphine. I'm sorry. <laughs> so buf buprenorphine is an opioid. Is that correct? It is. Okay. So what, tell yeah, us first, what uh, is an opioid? Back this, back us up a little bit before we get into that, because we just dropped a bombshell here. So we're talking about opioids today. We're talking about also how, how we can use this, I guess, to treat mental health and also mental health care at the Jesse Brown VA. Tell us first, what is an opioid? Sure, so, so an opioid is you know, a, a class of you know, chemical compounds um, that includes morphine and its derivative Heroin, um, you know, Vicodin, Oxycontin, uh, you know, the, the medicin, medic, uh, well, the substances that you know, responsible for this opioid epidemic that's uh, uh, been killing people more and more frequently as, as they overdose. Uh, you know, and it, it, it's dangerous, much more dangerous than uh, most substances of abuse because of the way it can um, cause you to stop breathing uh, and, and die. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, well, you know, unfortunately during the pandemic, you know, where, whereas our country had seemed to make great strides in, in turning the tide of this epidemic of, of opioid overdoses, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we've seen increasing rates of, of substance abuse and, and, uh, you know, including overdoses on, on opioids. Uh, so, you know, within Jesse Brown VA, you know, one of the things we've been doing is trying to expand access to a, a medication called buprenorphine, uh, which is similar to, uh, you know, traditional methadone uh, treatments for, for opioid use disorder. Uh, but this medication is nice in that it's a little safer. And, you know, in the first 90 days of treatment, you, you're less likely to have an overdose while you're, while you're doing opioid replacement treatment with buprenorphine. And it's and it can be more uh, accessible. You know, methadone clinics require you to uh, come in, you know, six days a week when you first start, but this medicine can be prescribed in an office setting with uh, less stringent requirements in, in, in terms of um, coming in and presenting daily uh, to pick up the medication. A lot of people are very nervous when they think about opioids because the first thing we think about is addiction. So what's the difference between like fentanyl, oxycontin, heroin versus uh, buprenorphine? So right, they're all in the same class and people should be nervous <laughs> about them. And, and you know, I encourage everyone to, to, to be hesitant and stay away and, and you know, don't, don't develop a, a problem with those substances. It's going to be very uh, hard to quit. Um, but because it's so hard to quit, um, you know, these opioid replacement treatments have actually been shown to be most effective for people once they develop an addiction, you, you know, so, so it seems counterintuitive, right? You know, why would you um, give somebody another opioid when, you know, that's a substance they've been having problems with? But, but the rea reality is, you know, by prescribing a medication like that in a controlled setting and, and engaging somebody, you know, in, in, in treatment and psychosocial interventions at the same time, you can dramatically decrease the, the risk of overdosing and make somebody more likely to you know, hold a job, repair their relationships with their uh, friends and families, and, and just overall improve their their functioning. Um, so 
you know, it's, 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 it's the best treatment we have. Um, and then, you know, buprenorphine, but better than methadone, just because it's, it's safer. Um, it's what we refer to as a high, in, a high affinity partial agonist. And, you know, that just gets into the way it, it, it works as a chemical. It's uh, alone, you know, it, it's very difficult and nearly impossible to overdose on, on just buprenorphine. Um, then, you know, those other medications and, and substances, substances you mentioned, uh, you know, they, they can, you know, be strong enough to, uh, to cause you to stop breathing. Um, but buprenorphine in and of itself, you know, not lethal. It, it has a ceiling at some point, you know, you saturate all your receptors in your brain and, and taking more just doesn't make a difference. And then I mentioned it's high affinity. So, you, you know, uh, you take that medication, it uh, will, you know, attach to your opioid receptors in your brain more strongly than those other opioids and actually dislodge them. And there are cases where people were, were overdosing on, on heroin or another opioid and, and took buprenorphine and and even though it's not a, you know, what we call a, an opioid antagonist, but because it's a high affinity, low potency opioid, it dislodges those other opioids and can actually reverse a, and, uh, an overdose. I, I don't recommend using it that way, but in a pinch, uh, it works out and, and you know, it's just part of its safety profile and, and part of the reason that at our uh, facility, we're trying to make buprenorphine more available to our veterans. So to kind of understand you a little bit better, so so basically from what you just described, so the uh, buprenorphine can block the, because when I understand it, your receptors is what is what's receiving these different types of chemicals, these different types of opioids, and these receptors, once you right. have a certain heroin, if you have heroin on your receptor, you're getting high. But from what I understand is, you know, these types of drugs, the ones that are dangerous, it doesn't stay in your system that long. It gets you this intense rush and euphoric feeling, but it doesn't stay in your system. Um, the, the importance of it blocking your receptors, I guess, reduces pain or gives, gives you that euphoria. Is that right? Uh, well, so it's a little different thing, right? right. It, it, it doesn't block your receptors, the, the buprenorphine. Uh, you know, if you think of your opioid receptor as a, a dimmer switch okay. where, you know, a, a medicine like fentanyl is, is the one that's going to crank it up all the way. You know, okay. that, 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 that stimulates your receptor more, more so than heroin. Um, you know, more so than, than, than morphine. But buprenorphine will just turn it up a little bit. And, and you know, it's, and, and, and that little bit is enough to, you know, get somebody who's, who's addicted to get relief from their cravings. can give you a little bit of pain control if, if you know, pain is, is part of your, um, you know, problem or, you know, associated with your addiction. And, and that little bit of stimulation, stimulation, you know, that tickling of the receptor is enough to give a little bit of relief you know, curb those cravings, um, you know, keep you from seeking out other substances. And, and then, you know, since it's a high affinity drug, if you've taken it in the morning and if you, you know, started the day intending not to do anything, but something happens and you were tempted and, and ended up using heroin during the day, well, you took your buprenorphine in the morning and, you know, the, the buprenorphine got there first. The heroin can't, uh, you know, give you the high, give you the buzz that you were looking for. And, and, and you know, just as a behavioral intervention, you know, that works great. That, that, that de-incentivizes the behavior next time, you know, you won't be tempted because you know I made the right choice in the morning, that mor- you know, that morning, and, and, you know, I didn't want to get high, and now I can't get high. Okay. And this particularly, is this strictly for, so is buprenorphine, is that something mainly for getting people off of addiction or addiction to, to uh, opioids in general? Or is it also used for other other uh, medical treatments? Uh, it's a medication that's been around for a while, but since uh, 2000 it has been used for uh, opioid use disorder. There's other formulations also available, notably a, a, a patch, a transdermal um, formulation that's used for, for treating pain. And again, you know, um, people who take opioids for pain have, have risk of, of overdosing and so, you know, if, if you don't need that, you know, stronger um, stimulation of those other opioids, you know, taking something like buprenorphine, if it is adequate for your pain, can be much safer. So is buprenorphine better than taking or can it be a replacement for taking something like methadone or taking something like oxycontin or fentanyl? Yeah, absolutely. So why haven't we done this to this point? Because from my understanding, this has been around since the 70s. So why, why are we doing this? Why are we looking at it right now as opposed to why hasn't it been around for a while? 
Well, uh, so we've been, you know, it's, it's becoming more and more a, a, a part of the, you know, opioid use disorder treatment culture. You know, with time, we, we didn't know right away that it was, you know, safer than methadone, you know, the most traditional um, treatment uh, that, you know, studies have shown. And, and not surprisingly, based on, you know, the, the chemical profile that we're talking about, uh, that high affinity partial agonism that... Uh, it is safer, but now we know that, you know, those first 90 days of when you're in treatment that you are less likely to overdose taking buprenorphine compared to, to methadone. Um, you know, honestly, I, I think part of the factor, too, is just, it's become cheaper. You know, the, the original patents that the drug company has and, and drug companies had in 2000, you know, have run their course. It's become more accessible. as It's become a, a more affordable uh, medication. And then, you know, what we're trying to do, well, and, and then, you know, just I, I think our, our country is getting wise. Um, and, you know, it just makes sense to have something like buprenorphine more available than things like, you know, Oxycontin and, and other medications that were, uh, that many physicians were, you know, misled to believe were, were safe to prescribe. Um, so, so I don't know if you're aware, but, but you know, to prescribe methadone for the treatment of opioid use disorder, you have to go through lots of requirements and, uh, you know, prescribing it and only an opioid treatment program, you know, settings that were highly regulated and, you, you know, you have to get special permission to prescribe. And then, you know, in 2000, you know, is uh, the, the day of 2000 waivers were available and, and buprenorphine could now be prescribed also for the treatment of opioid use disorder. But, but you'd have to, you know, do an eight-hour training, and you'd have to get an extra visit from the DEA, and you'd have to track all the, the patients that you're treating, and, and you still, and then you're capped with how many patients you could treat. But, you know, the the DEA, SAMHSA, they've been getting wiser. So, you know, during the pandemic, if you it, buprenorphine was the only medication that could be started as a new prescription that that's a controlled substance over the phone. Um, even during the pandemic, if you were going to start any other controlled substance, you had to have a video visit or an in-person visit. Um, but you know, now we're, we're pushing this out. We're getting wise that it makes more sense to have buprenorphine more available. And then within my own facility, well, see, I mentioned that eight-hour training. So now that that requirement has been waived, and physicians can just you know notify the DEA they're interested in prescribing and be granted that waiver without completing the training that had been required in the past. So, so in my facility, you know, we've been rolling it out, you know, instead of just having our specialty addiction psychiatrists prescribing in their clinic or prescribing buprenorphine in general, general mental health clinics in our emergency room uh, and our inpatient psychiatry and medical floors, and, and we're just trying to expand from there to, you know, make this medication more available and, and get our veterans the help that they need. So what's the connection between buprenorphine and helping veterans prevent suicide or, or not have the temptation for suicide? Well, I, maybe not as – it's more so preventing overdoses, okay. right? And then sometimes, uh, you know, overdoses is, is the chosen mean uh, for suicide. You know, some, some overdoses are intentional, you know, others – Many others are, are accidental. And what's the, the and what? How important does it play with, with the peer support? How does that play into the whole treatment and also the prescribing and things like that? How does what separates? Because from what I understand, um, uh, uh, buprenorphine is not a hundred percent successful. It, is, it depends on the person. It depends on a lot of circumstances and things like that. What makes it more successful? Well, you know. Various factors, you know, pain on the medication, you know, more than anything, uh, you know, not dropping out of treatment. Uh, you know, folks have a hard time getting on buprenorphine sometimes because, you know, it, it doesn't turn that opioid switch up all the way. Uh, so you, you actually have to be in withdrawal when you start taking it and, uh, you know, can have a, experience a little withdrawal on, on the first couple doses. Uh, if your body's used to having a, a higher concentration of, of, you know, opioid stimulation available. Um, but then, you know, the, the other thing is just like getting folks to stick with it and save the program. You know, the studies show you can't 
can't stop the medicine too fast. Um, you know, and, and I always encourage my patients just to be patient and take their time. You know, the, the, you know, they start taking buprenorphine and they're doing well and they're not using heroin anymore. And then they, you know, can be in a rush to get off of it. But, you know, their studies have shown you can stop too soon. And, you know, the quicker you stop or the sooner you stop, you can be more likely to, to overdose or relapse. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I try to teach my veterans to, to be patient with the process and with themselves and, uh, you know, make all those behavior changes, too, that are, that are associated with recovery in terms of, you know, breaking that relationship with their with their drug dealer or, you know, wherever their, whatever their opiate of cho- choice is and where they're getting it and, uh, and other things. But, but you mentioned peer support, too, and, it, you know, that's something I, I also wanted to, to mention, but, but it's it changing the subject a little bit. But, but uh, you know, it's Mental Health Awareness Month, and, you know, if, if anything, my purpose of being here today is to encourage more veterans to, to take care of, you know, take advantage of their benefits and, you know, have the courage to be vulnerable and, and admit when they're not okay and, and get the, the help they need. So what makes peer support so great is, you know, these are other veterans in recovery from, from their own mental uh, illness and, uh, you, you know, just showing, you know, how recovery works and how great it can be and, you know, kind of, you know, I can do it, so can you uh, kind of message. And, and they're just extremely effective at, at, at destigmatizing treatment and, and helping us to engage and, and motivate veterans to, to pursue their own recovery. Mm-hmm. A doctor, and it's something I know a lot of people talk about this in everyday society, especially in social media, but is mental is, is addiction a mental illness? Uh, yes, I According to the American Psychiatric Association, yeah, that the, the addictive disorders yeah, uh, are, are a form of, of mental illness. Do we do you think that we treat it that way in society in general? When we think about it in everyday life, do we treat mental or addiction as a mental illness? Do we or do we? How do we really see? It? Is it more? How do we stigmatize it? I you know, from my perspective. You know, mental illness broadly is stigmatized, and, and people have a hard time admitting they're not, you know, okay and, and seeking treatment and, um, you know, getting help with the problems. And, but then within um, mental health, I, I think, you know, addiction has an, has additional uh, stigma, uh, you know, that, that, that's even worse, you know, to, to admit that, uh you know, you have an addiction, you've lost control, that you need help. Um, you know, I, I think that's even extra challenging. Hmm. And then as a psychiatrist, um, can you kind of give me an idea, like how someone gets to the point or how someone could have the uh, the idea that they can control or have the notion they can control an addiction? Because I, see, I hear that oftentimes people have either, either have an alcohol problem or they have a, a drug problem. Um, they get to maybe a point where they recognize they have a problem because something horrible happened. Usually they're, they're knocking on death's door or something horrible happened with a reaction or whatever, uh, the overdose or something like that. But then they get to the point where they thought they could get away from it, but then they say, you know what, I'm not going to go away from it completely. I'm just going to see if I'm just going to manage it. I'm going to, I have it under control. Yeah. And I, I, I think some people have more success than others, but, but you know, these illnesses run, run a spectrum. You know, where 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 uh, some people function better than others, and you know, and, and rock bottom sometimes looks different from one person to another. Um, you know, where they're finally motivated to get some help. But but with any you know mental illness, you know, mental illness requires two things. Uh, any mental illness, you need, you must suffer to have mental illness, and it must impair your functioning. Mm-hmm. Right. So. So, so substance use is not the same thing as a substance use disorder. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a spectrum, spectrum from, you know, folks that experiment and try something once and decide they don't like it, somebody who starts to develop a habit, you know, to, to somebody who, who loses control and it, it can cost them, you know, their jobs, their relationships, their health. Um, and, and, you know, it's... It, it's along a continuum and it varies person to person. And, you know, I think the, the sooner one realizes, uh, 
you know, the, the negative outcomes associated with their use, the, the better off they are. And, uh, you know, we're just here to, to help people, um, you know, get control of their lives and, and get their functioning back and, and you know, lead the most fulfilling life possible. Dr. John Corpick, Psychiatric Director of Mental Health at the at Services at Jesse Brown VA. We appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming on our show and giving us some great information about a drug that can actually help people get off addiction. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me again. This is America Heroes Group. We'll be right back. <laughs>